So this is the third talk that Anne McShane is giving to Hopi, very timely. This is um, at a time when the Islamic Republic has started a new wave of arrests and legislation, new legislation regarding forced hijab in Iran. Um, this is following months of protests about the same issue and the fact that over the last few months, quite a number of women have uh, removed their headscarves in Iran voluntarily, and now they are facing punishment for doing this. And we'll talk about Ujum, and she will explain aspects of this, but also the general policies of the party regarding women in the southern republics of the Soviet Union. Correct me, Anne, if I make a mistake, but that's the general thing. And it's very important because in the same ways that um, we should oppose the Islamic Republic's forced hijab, there are lessons to be learned about how to deal with sensitive issues such as head covering amongst Muslim women, some of whom might be secular, others who might be uh, religious and uh, following their um, Islamic um, law and Islamic custom. So go ahead, Anne. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. So today, um, I want to talk about the role of the Women's Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the Genotel, and their role in relation to Eastern women, and particularly in relation to women of Central Asia and what was to become Uzbekistan. Um, I've also looked at their work in Azerbaijan, but Uzbekistan is what I know more about in the 1920s. So after the Genotel was formed, it began to consider what work they would do outside of Russia and in the former Tsarist, former Tsarist um, regime. And the women of the East appeared to them to be the most profoundly oppressed. Um, they saw them as basically not having any rights. Um, they saw them as being you know, oppressed, both in terms of their status domestically, but also because they couldn't play any role in larger society, not in the same way as men and, and not in the same way as women in Russia. So they saw the veil as something which was emblematic of a deeper oppression. And certainly Alexandra Kollontai, she wrote on the question of Central Asian women and veiled women and how they needed to achieve liberation. But interestingly, this is at the very beginning of the 1920s. What they talked about was about these women achieving their own self-liberation, taking things into their own hands. So in Central Asia and in Azerbaijan at the time, I believe that the majority of women who were veiled were veiled or were fully veiled with a, a paranji, which was the long veil, and a chakvon, which was the facial veil. And they would have been mostly urban women, although some peasant women were in that situation. However, because peasant women worked in the fields, it wasn't, you know, so easily done, um, but perhaps on occasions. And it, it said that this veiling practice actually became more intense in the late 1800s because of resentment of local communities towards the Tsarist regime and the idea that they wanted to keep their culture um loyal to Islam and, and not be Russified. So in any event, when the women of the Genotel first started to work in Central Asia, um, they described there a society where women were separated, who lived in the, in the larger family um, uh, kind of modes of, of, of 
establishments, you know, and they live in and around the courtyards of patriarchal family, women, aunts, mothers, girls, younger daughters, nieces, nephews, like would be a large family. And they would all live in the family home, um, but, but they were only allowed to unveil when they were among their relatives, um, female relatives in particular, and immediate male relatives. And they certainly were not allowed to leave their homes without a veil covering. And in fact, they weren't generally allowed to leave their homes. So what the Genotel decided to do at its first conference among activists of the East was to employ a different way of operating among Central Asian and in particular veiled women. And uh, in fact, they had plans to have a non-party Women of the East conference in 1921, but it didn't happen. It was cancelled by the party leadership. So, so anyway, but they did have this meeting of the activists of the East. And what they decided to do was rather than having delegate meetings, which is what I've talked about before, where women organized in districts and in workplaces and sent um, interns away to be trained in other parts of the Soviet economy and governance, they realized here that there's no way that this could work. So they set up women-only establishments, and these were called women's clubs. Now, I know there were, def there were clubs were not an uncommon way to organize during the 1920s, but these were specific because basically only women could enter these establishments. And within them, they organized a number of initiatives. So they taught women um, skills in terms of practical skills, weaving and uh, shoemaking and other carpet making. Um, they also educated them. So there were literacy classes. They had um, childcare available, so women, their children were looked after and educated while the women were there. They had medical consultations, they had choirs and other cultural activity, they had all, all manner of activity. So it was just like a big community hub. And they modelled what they wanted to create in Uzbekistan on a club called the Ali Bayramova, which was in um, Azerbaijan, in Baku. Um, which was a very successful club. Um, and I think because things were more advanced, I think in terms of um, culturally, you know, women in Azerbaijan, there were, there, there were more things they were able to do. Maybe women were a bit more confident. Um, but in any event, in, in, in Uzbekistan, it was a bit more, more slow to create these um, establishments anywhere. In 1921, they had this conference, but it wasn't until 1923 that they actually properly began their work there because of the civil war. And also because Colin Tide was removed from leadership in 21. And it took another woman called Luby Mova, um, who had actually been taught by Colin Ty, had gone to Sverdlov University and attended her lectures there and was very influenced by her. And so she began to lead this work in Central Asia. So they set up a number, I think there were maybe half a dozen clubs and their work there you know, moved along okay, but it was difficult. Um, primarily the difficulty was that they didn't get much support from men in the organization. Um, and therefore also because the cooperative movement uh, ignored them and women themselves were in a difficult position because they weren't able to go to the markets to sell their produce. So whatever they made in these clubs um, would remain unsold unless there was cooperation from the cooperative movement itself. So anyway, so that was making some progress, but then in 1925, they made a, an enormous advance with the involvement for the first time properly of Uzbek women. So Lubimova um, supported and facilitated the creation of an Uzbek women's journal in 1924. And this was called Yang Yol, which is uh, free life, um, 
and it our new life anyway so this journal was aimed at Uzbek women and there was in fact a layer of Uzbek women of the intelligentsia who had already who their male partners husbands brothers had already been drawn to the Soviet project because they were a modernist in their attitude and anyway these women were the main women who became part of the Jeanne Hotel in the area and wrote for the journal and with their involvement obviously other Uzbek women joined them and what they set up was a shop a cooperative shop and these shops there were maybe by by 1920 seven there were about 15 16 of these shops now what was very important about these shops was that they were self-sustaining women would bring their produce and sell it at the shops and then also could buy what they needed at the shop so rather than having to be accompanied to a market by their husband they could maybe they had to have somebody walk with them but once they went in there they could take off their veil and they could be among other women and they would be it would be like a little enclave like they in the family but now it was in the public sphere within the public sphere so and at these clubs as well as the produce being bought and sold they had readings of Yang Yol and they had um you know practical activities such as teaching women how to look after their children, medical consultations, basically all the things that had been planned for the clubs now took place in these establishments. And in and so they were very happy about this, the Russian women, because basically their ideas had began to take root and indigenous women were fashioning them according to their own needs. And while, you know, 15 shops is not a large number, I think it marked a significant success in that kind of interpenetration that this was becoming something organic because it met people's needs. Both the men and the women have met their needs. And although the Jeanne spoke about the veil in very disparaging terms, you know, being darkness and bad for women's health because they've been covered and, you know, they were very against it, but they never sought to convince women to remove it because they knew that by doing so, they would put them in, in danger and in a situation where they would be in an immediate clash with their families and already they had problems with this because during this period, uh, the Soviet Union of, had already, of course, introduced divorce. And these divorce laws were instituted in the new republics after national delimitation. And very many women sought divorces, which, you know, like was quite exciting in a way. But the trouble was, is that there was a lack of an economic structure to assume them into, you know, that the society there was still either um, artisan based in the towns and cities or peasant culture. There weren't any factories at that stage, um, not, not that I would know of in terms of mass workplace opportunities. So kind of society didn't, society hadn't caught up with that, with that, with the the wishes of the women to, for freedom from families and arranged marriages. So that was already a problem. And I think the general gel did not want to create more of these problems because it led to prostitution and homelessness. But in any event, this was what I would describe as a successful approach because it was sensitive to the needs of women. Uh, and it it, and it did focus on working class women, on peasant women, and it sought to put them in a position of having some kind of an economic independence and being able to be educated with support, of course, in terms of childcare. So then everything changes in 1926. So I can pause there if that's um, a good time to pause or do you want me to carry on? Yeah, can I just ask a couple of, this is fascinating stuff because also uh, we should know a lot more as Iranians from Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan and all this. I wasn't aware of most of what you've just said. 
Can I ask a couple of very minor questions? One is you talked about the non-party women of this conference didn't take place, and then they had a activists of the East. Was this non-party and party members, or was that just party members? And also you refer to Azerbaijan women being slightly more ahead. And I wondered if that was um, that, for example, the means of production were more developed in Azerbaijan. I don't want you necessarily to answer, but to speculate like I do on this. But also, um, in some ways, um, you referred to the fact that in the in the 1880s, um, there was an opposition to Russification that led to an increase in hijab. And that's definitely true of the Middle East in general, not now in Iran, but that's true in general, that if like the westernization, the Iraq war, um, the way the West presents itself as superior to um, the Islamic world has increased uh, veils. So in all of these, I can see parallels. But if you could just expand on the question of the activist and Azerbaijan women. OK, so when the Genotel was created, it involved so it was a department of the party, but it involved many non-party women. Mm. So many members of the Genotel were not members of the party, although they wanted the Genotel wanted to recruit them to the party. At the same time, they wanted to be a voice for women in general within the party. So I had that kind of dual approach. But in 1920 and 21, there were a number of non-party conferences were taking place. And I think that they were in general to recruit more, well, to perhaps to kind of stimulate more activism among the working class and to recruit them to the party. And this non-party women's conference was due to take place in the April 1921, and it was postponed until June, but then it never actually took place. So the activist meeting of Women of the East was basically, um, they were obviously, they were either Communist Party women who, who had started to work in Turkestan or in Azerbaijan, but some of them were not party women. So. What happened in 1920 um, was that they began to hold these meetings in the East. I, I don't know exactly how they got in contact with them, but there were a couple of people. There was a woman called Concordia Samilova who, who, who went to the East and she sailed up and down the rivers and recruited people. So she may have been the one that was instrumental in putting these establishing these roots. So in fact, it, it's hard to know very much about it. I don't know at the moment because Komuniska only was only established in 1920 and a lot of this work I think had already been carried out. But in any event, um, in, 19, in June 1921, lots of women from the East came to uh, Moscow but they came because they had understood that they were coming to this non-party conference. And instead, when they got there, they took part in the Comintern Congress and they attended the women's conference. And there are descriptions of these veiled women coming in and coming to the stage and speaking and, you know, tremendous applause. And that was fantastic. But the truth was, is that they weren't there for that event, they were there to org start to organize themselves. And afterwards, it didn't happen. And I have read somewhere that this was because of Colin Ty falling out of favor and basically a clampdown being put on work. Now, and it could be well as well because of other issues. I don't know. But certainly the work was neglected in the East between 21 and 23. There was little done. 
Um, so, you know, there's lots of questions to be asked about what was happening there, maybe with the introduction of NIP, there was cuts in funding and all of those things. But I think that maybe there wasn't anybody in, there wasn't anybody in the East doing the work. So Colin and I had started it. I think that the first conference of activists of women in the East, however, took place in Moscow. So they would have traveled there for that. They expected the next conference to be a non-party conference in June, and then then never happened. So in 23 things got 23 things started all over again. So that's that. Um and, and you know, when you read, sorry, just to say and also on that, when you read Colin Ty and Sam Malova, they're talking about women taking things into their own hands. Now they believed at the time that women in the East, having heard about the revolution would use that opportunity to rise up. And there was a certain sense in that because obviously things were happening everywhere, weren't they? They were happening in, in Baku and, you know, there were Soviets been set up throughout and, and, there, and there were these nucleuses of women's organizations being set up as well. So, so yeah, so that happened then. And then the second point I think you made about was, uh it was it about um the resistance of of the of the local um leaders to russification yes now that's something i've read about in the work of marianne camp in particular who's a very interesting uh woman she's done a lot of her research in uzbek language so she she notes that there was this particular um opposition to Russification, but it seems to me that uh, also, although there was this kind of um, attempt to seal off their women from any form of modernization, um, that the Russian authorities, the pre-revolutionary um, Russian authorities, sort of did, did, did not really try to intervene, um, and that the the Russians and the and because there were plenty of Russians, of course, there and um, Russian officials and um, Russian some Russian workers in the factories that did exist probably in Azerbaijan. Um, in the, I'm not sure about Kazakhstan, but that they did keep their distance, but they were resented because of the way they operated. Didn't they they operated in a way they kind of use they, they played one section off of off against another and they obviously believe themselves to be superior and and yes so there was a resentment towards them and and um in terms of islam so uh there's a uh, adib khalib who was a not who's another interesting writer he's he he d describes islam in central asia and much of that area as more custom rather than particularly hardcore religion you know that it wasn't that people were uh religious how can i describe it that they that they were that it was their culture that that it was part of their culture this religion was part of their culture rather than being a mobilizing religion um and so in any event that's yeah that's that's the impression that that i get but that the fact of a uh, intrusion from outside would 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 stimulate such resentment that religion became more important as a signifier of difference against the invader. So um so yeah so that was something that the genital experienced when they were first setting up clubs. Although at the same time I've spoken briefly about the Jadid um who were a secular movement and modernist maybe maybe i mean i suppose they were secular they they, they definitely were different from the old um imams and they they were they basically believed that the soviet project was one that was would, would be useful for them in order to to achieve their national identity and autonomy so i think particularly the creation of the republics was something that they were very much in favor of and many of them were in government so so therefore i think that's why 24 becomes important because then with that movement the women of the east in uzbekistan 
um, perhaps also in Azerbaijan, they're then in the more, how can I say, they become closer to the project as a whole because their, their section of society um, becomes involved. So yeah, so I think the kind of idea of self-emancipation, um, self-determination was very important. Anyway, I don't know about there's that's something. that's very good. Thanks very much. Yeah, you covered everything. I just um uh, in the next section or now, if you want, you also said that um uh, the women considered their job bad for women's health. I mean, I agree in some ways that's true, but did they have a justification for this? I mean, in one way, in a modern system, the hijab is a problem because it can, you know, you have limited view, for example. Yeah, you you really can't see her. Well, I've tried it, and uh, both as a pedestrian, as a driver, or someone running for a bus or a train, you really are in danger. But at that time, I think they probably meant it in a different way, that you wouldn't get light or. I, I don't know. It's quite is a very interesting point because um, you're absolutely right that religion, even in Iran, even now, has a lot to do with custom rather than necessarily amongst the few, amongst the clerics. It's you know hardline belief and so on, but in many cases, it is what your mother has done, your grandmother has done, and that's what you do. It's not necessarily a very and and there's schizophrenic attitudes towards religion because you might fast for example but you might also drink alcohol after the fast or you know this kind of um, contradictory behavior but i'm fascinated by the terms that it's bad for your health which is interesting comment anyway i'll let you go on sorry well, just on that, just to say on that, um, there's a woman called, there was a woman called Anna Newkrat, who was a leading member of the Genogel towards the end of the 1920s. Now, she was actually Turkic, and some of the Turkic women who were, you know, part of the Jadi tradition were extremely hostile to the veil. Um, and they took a lot of their, um, inspiration from the um, unveiled women in the Jadid movement and the I'm trying to remember what 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 part of Russia had become unveiled and more secular anyway I've I've got, it's gone out of my head now but in any event they were very hostile to the veil so she wasn't a Russian saying this and actually it's picked up by a number of academics she's used as a way to um to evidence the manner in which the, the Russians were hostile, um, but she was particularly hostile. So yes, they saw it as keeping them in ignorance. So, you know, it kept them behind, you know, the what they would talk about or write about the thick walls, you know, the, the that they were imprisoned behind these thick walls and then imprisoned in this veil and that it kept them in ignorance because they weren't allowed out generally and they didn't engage, so they were isolated. And also it was believed that they were covered, them, them being covered meant that they didn't have any sunlight. So from a health point of view, I think, and then they thought that that was bad. And then they thought that it was bad that their children couldn't go out with them and see their faces and that there were all sorts of problems in terms of them being able to interact which then caused problems for their children. So, you know, like that the woman couldn't be, could not be a parent, could not be an educator as a parent because she was ignorant and she was kept behind this veil. Now, you can say that there were like patronizing attitudes, but at the same time, also you can see arguments for it. But in reality, what they did wasn't to go around demanding that women unveil because it's bad for them, but to provide opportunities for them to unveil in the safe environment. And maybe they hoped that having had that experience, that they would have more confidence to unveil, but it generally wasn't discussed in Komuniska as a plan to, 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 to get women into that position. Now, if they went to Moscow, 
which they did in the, the event that I described earlier, then they did unveil and it was very dramatic. And that was, you know, all part of a rite of passage for them, but also a, a was symbolic, I think, for the women of the common turn of a great liberation taking place. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So. Very interesting. I'll, I'll let you get on. I stopped you a bit. Yeah. Oh, Carry oh. on. So in 1926, a, a shift comes about, and this is coinciding with the position in the Central Committee of uh, Stalin at last uh, solidifying power among, around himself. So the Central Committee of the Communist Party has changed and the period of infighting has been kind of brought to an end and Stalin is now in charge. And in um, 1926, the Central Committee decided that it wanted to do something about the clergy in the East. And they decided that the Central Asian Bureau, Shredaz Bureau, would lead a fight. And the fight was termed uh, the Hujum, which in, in Russian is Nastuplenia and means attack. And I think it maybe has the same meaning um, in, in, in Persian or in Turkic. Um, and so during the summer of 1926, there were meetings of genital women and one of them took place in Moscow and it was announced at that meeting that they were to be at the forefront of this campaign, which as well as attacking a number of religious cultural symbols would focus on mass unveiling of women. So um, Marianne Camp reports on one of these meetings at which Lubimova was present and at which she objected to the unveiling campaign and said that she believed that it would incite opposition from reactionary elements. So again, we're coming back to that question that you raised earlier of, of um, pressure from outside attacking a local cultural tradition, provoking um, reaction. So she was very conscious of that. So she objected. And then um, what actually happened was that there was a Hutchum commission set up and a number of the uh, Jadid women who were, I suppose I should say Uzbek women, who were involved in Yang Yol, um, they were part of this commission. So I think it was like a four person commission and there were two men and two women. And the two women on the commission were both Uzbek women. So they were supporters of modernization and supporters of unveiling. So what was agreed on the commission was that there would be a mass unveiling on March the 8th, 1927. And the Day when it came produced mass demonstrations and mass unveiling and burning of the veils, both the Chakvam and the Paranji, the long veil. And the in interesting thing about it is that it was a kind of a coincidence of force and voluntary unveiling, because there was definitely an order sent out to the members of the party that they had to unveil their wives and daughters and mothers, and they were forcibly unveiled. And maybe some of them were led there and forced to unveil. I'm not sure on th those days, but there certainly were demonstrations at which women were unveiled. And at one stage later on at a meeting where women were unveiled at gunpoint. But on the first March the 8th, there were many indigenous women who unveiled voluntarily. And I believe that they saw this again as an opportunity to express their own political ambitions and personal wishes within the Soviet project. So they, they unveiled, there was something like 50,000 said to have unveiled that day. And there were reports in the Russian Soviet papers afterwards of this major revolution taking place in the East. But very soon afterwards, things turned uh, very badly 
wrong. And the, there was a huge upswell of antagonism, both from the clergy and from male party members and from men generally in Uzbek society. And very many women were attacked, were murdered, um, were forced to stay at home. And although the Hujjum carried on with another mass unveiling on the 1st of May, Workers' Day, and then afterwards, they did they did push it, continue to push it right through into the five year plan because it wasn't good for the five year plan for women to be veiled. They couldn't go into the collective farms and the factories with veils on. Nevertheless, there seems to have been some recognition in 1927 that this was a disaster because of the fact that it provoked such opposition. And in terms of the Russian genotel, there was no article in Komuniska for the entirety of that year on this question, with the exception of one in August of 1927. And the article was written by uh, Nikolaeva, who had been a former supporter of Colin Tybo, who had shifted to support Stalin's leadership at this stage. And she bemoaned the fact that the genotel had done nothing to protect unveiled women, had not absorbed them into its clubs and shops, et cetera, et cetera, and had not supported the campaign. Um, and then basically it, it got the blame. She blamed that, and she also blamed party men not being sufficiently committed to it. So I think like many party men were opposed to it. So some obeyed, some didn't obey. And the the most important thing about it from the point of view of the Genotel was that it meant the complete closure of its project in Central Asia. So its clubs, there was no women coming, there were no women coming to clubs anymore. They weren't safe because they were tainted with the Soviet government and what the Soviet government had just done, you know, to um, unveil masses of the population who had previously been veiled and were seen as a symbol of Uzbek uh, religious culture. And also what happened with the shops was even stranger in a certain sense in that the central cooperative closed the shops down and said that there was no need for them anymore because of the fact that women had now unveiled. They didn't need women only shops. So they closed them. So they were all gone uh, by the by the end of 1927. Um, and then there was a debate in the journal Komuniska after that on the on the impact of it. So that's the um, story so far. So many parallels in some way in 1938, and I think influenced by events both in the Soviet Union, but also Turkey and all the whole Era in Iran, the extra son did a forced unveiling, right? And what happened was that this was part of his modernization. He wanted Iran to be modern. So what happened was that, for example, my grandmother remembers that she was in the street and she was uh, uh, the a policeman removed her headscarf, mm. after which he used to wear a hat. <laughs> Um, and this was this was not all over the country. So it was in, you know, she lived in the capitals. That's what happened. I think what happened then was a reaction to this by the clergy and by the supporters of Vail, partly because it couldn't affect all the country. You made a very important point earlier about women in the countryside not being not wearing the full hijab because they can't, they're working in the field and they can't. However, in the countryside, they did have something on their hair. And the police never went there because it wasn't interested. It was just the towns they were interested. So it created this duality between women who were wearing headscarves, the ones who weren't. And later in the rule of Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, the ex Shah, actually this became a class distinction between men, between women of different classes. So upper class and upper middle class women were mainly unveiled. They didn't wear a headscarf 
you know, maybe their generation never wore it since 1938. But then they looked down on women who did wear headscarf in the urban areas. And uh, the term traduri, which means scarf or veiled, veiled woman, became like a, an insult. And so you would say things like, oh, well, my servants are traduri, they are wearing the chador, but of course I'm of upper income and upper class, so I don't wear it. And I think this force, this concept of forced veil actually probably enforced Islamic behavior, both in Iran and in Turkey during the late 30s. Rather, the aim was to, if you like, modernize the country, move it away from Islam, but it did the exact opposite. Um, I mean, it'd be, uh, it's very difficult because I'm not a historian of those eras. I haven't done a lot of work. But maybe I'm sure there are people who have written about this and who say that it actually enforced it. Um, um, I don't know if Ujum <laughs> played a role in some of that as well, but a, a very a very interesting, very fascinating uh, event. I'll let you carry on. Yes, yeah, so um, in terms of the Genotel, 1928 was a period of, well, I suppose there were counter, there were countervailing pressures. Firstly, 1927, the Party Congress, Stalin announced the first five-year plan. So 1928 was the preparation for the five-year plan, getting society mobilized. And and so that was discussed in the journal. But the other thing that was discussed was the impact of the hujum. And there were a number of views expressed. The first of them was really about what the men in the East had done or not done. So there was a belief that the hujum was a badly timed um, I suppose, what kind of superficial type of operation that really didn't mean anything. As far as, you see, I, they, they never spoke directly, like and said, it was the Central Committee's fault. I think that they probably could not have done that then. But what they argued was that the veil, the unveiling was only going to be any good if it meant that women could come to um, their, you know, clubs and shops or whatever involvement they had in society in safety. But at the same time as the veiling was happening, these opportunities were being closed down deliberately or de facto. So basically what it meant was the further isolation of women from society. And that wasn't just because of the backlash. That was just because of the fact that the opportunities for them to go out completely evaporated. But then also um, they thought that um, unveiling women by force was completely counterproductive and unveiling women en masse was completely counterproductive and that it wasn't a serious policy aimed at liberating women. It was just a some kind of a staged you know, act um, to make it look as though women were unveil or emancipated when they when they actually weren't. So so there was a, a, an idea um, that there needed to be more autonomy from the party. And in fact it was argued that that the communist men were worse than the, than the men outside the party. Now, I don't know whether that was just the indigenous men or whether it was Russian men generally, but as I've said that um, the Jadid men were involved, who I would have thought that were more pro veil I'm, I'm really not sure, but I suppose the party recruited all sorts of individuals and they would have recruit, recruited people from the... Um, that were close to the clergy who would have been, you know, prominent in society. You know that I think that everything kind of found its way into the party, all sorts of elements. 
Anyway, so their argument was that some of these men were worse than men outside the party and they wanted to have more autonomy. And during 1927, there had been some initiatives in Uzbekistan around bringing together men and women who were pro um, secularization and against the hudjum, sorry, against the against polygamy, actually, and and arranged marriage. And so this was a sort of a voluntary organization outside of the party. Um, and in Kazakhstan, uh, where the genital had only been set up in 1927, there a society um, for a society against polygamy and uh, forced marriage uh, was was set up. An arranged marriage, I should say, was set up against calum and polygamy. And in the debate, uh, Lubimova said, well, you know, if they want to go and do this, let them go and do this. If they want autonomy, obviously they haven't been making much progress within the party, so let them off. But of course, this was not to the taste of the Central Committee. And indeed, um, Nadia Krupskaya, who was the editor of the journal and spoke at a Congress of Women of the East in December 1928, was also opposed to autonomy. So I suppose she was either against it because she believed that autonomy was not a good idea, um, or she had been kind of brought, you know, under the control of the party leadership. But she she argued that they wouldn't have the resources, and if they found a hardened party, how much harder would it be if you were just depending on yourself as individuals? So um, anyway, so the autonomy was. A resolution on autonomy was voted down at that Congress and the societies were closed down. So the autonomous societies were closed down straight afterwards. But at the same time, um, you also had the like the um, the top members of the Central Committee attended that conference also, which obviously was seen as an important event. They clearly had been watching or made aware of the fact that there was this debate on autonomy and that there were criticisms of the Hudjum. And Yaroslavsky came, who was one of Stalin's closest comrades and who was the leader of the anti-religious movement. And soon he was the initiator, initiator wasn't he, of the League for the Militant Godless. And... So he came and he laid down the law on this question as well. Um, there could be no autonomy. It all had to be the party leadership. And basically, they had to destroy the whole of, hold of religion in the East. And they were to, the genital were told that they were to take part in a purge within the party, a cleansing of the of alien elements in the party. And I don't think that that actually ever really worked out because there's very little about it in the journal for the following year. And in fact, there's very little of anything. And in 1930, the Genotel was closed down by Stalin. And one of the issues that they admitted was a problem is autonomy. They were against any more moves towards autonomy. Um, and also he said, um, the woman's question is solved, um, or, or he said, or they said, um, it hasn't been solved by the genotgel, the woman's only, it's become a woman only issue, so we'll bring it within the party and everybody in the party will deal with it, which meant that nobody would, in fact, dealt with, with it. So I think what happened in the East was very important in terms of the decision to close the genotgel down. Um, one thing I haven't said, but which is important, is that the genital in, in Russia was kind of, well, wasn't really separate in the same to the same extent that it was in the East, because they had delegate meetings and the districts and the factories and the men worked together with the women, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in the East, it was very separate. And although they complained, the genital women complained all the time about the lack of support. At the same time, they had some freedom to develop their ideas. And, and therefore, I think when this happened, when this, you know, mighty fist came down and crushed it all, the 
response was to go, well, we'll just go to the people in the in society that do support us and we'll become more autonomous. But of course, this was at a time when that wasn't going to be countenanced at all. Um, so I think although what they did was on a very small scale, I, I it's quite like instructive because you can see that by listening to the population and getting to know what they want, what they need, what they're interested in, even as a source, even as a force or a group coming from outside, you can make progress. And that it's not just simply a case of, as actually some academics make out that any kind of intervention was going to be negative. I don't agree with that. I think that a skillful intervention into a society which hadn't become, um, which which hadn't really become proletarianized and was at a very, you know, peasant and artisan level could still be effective because more than anything else, it could provide for education and, and an awareness. I mean, the idea was that the women of the East should know about the whole world. You know, that was, that's what they wanted to happen. And when you read, which I haven't been able to read the, the material in Uzbek, but when you read those historians that have looked at that, then, you know, you can see that they were deeply affected. And in fact, and this is just to conclude, whereas what you describe, what you describe in, in Iran um, didn't happen in Uzbekistan because of the force of the five-year plan and of Stalinism, because they were determined that, you know, there was going to be no opposition to this mass unveiling. And it's seen, I believe, in Uzbekistan today that this period of time of the Hujum um, is seen as part of the part of the national history, an important part of what makes Uzbekistan, because Uzbekistan now isn't a veiled society, although there are elements of Islamic uh, culture, I suppose, re-emerging, but generally it was secularized by force, I would say. Anyway, that's... that's very interesting. I, I was just going to actually say that, that when I look, I, I've never been to Uzbekistan, but when I see the images, women look unveiled in the majority. I'm sure there are some who do, and countryside is different, but in the majority. And also customs, uh, both uh, Persian customs like the New Year and so on have stayed, uh, and I'm sure the Islamic customs are there as well. You couldn't call it a religious society in the traditional Islamic sense of the world. Uh, uh, but whether this is a recipe to repeat is a different question. Uh, and I think you've put it in a good enough situation where you have to think about these things. This isn't, I, I, I think you are, uh, my in, immediate reaction is you've got the right balance that you can't have, you can't have no intervention because then you let what is existing to pers persevere forever. But on the other hand, you have to judge how that intervention is. Um, so it's a, it's a very complicated issue, but you've, you've given us a lot to think about. So thank you very much. This has been um, a fascinating series. I, I might have a lot of questions to continue another series with it, but I hope we can publish all three at some stage as well, as one piece. And I really enjoyed this talk because it, it's so palpable with what is going on in Iran right now. I mean, many people are asking the same questions in both ways. And, and there are, of course, those on the left who have in the past argued for forced unveiling. And they should really pause and think about it as well. So I'll let you, if you have any final comments, otherwise this was fantastic. Thank you very much. No, I really enjoy it. And it's, I really like the fact that you have experience or knowledge of this question from Iran. Yeah, that really helps to highlight the issues involved. So rather than it just simply being a, a history of a particular um, set of events 
that happens and this happens and that happens, but that you can see the the, the parallels yeah. and the issues involved. And fundamentally, the question of self-emancipation, that that has okay. to be that has to be at the core of of change um, so that people can actually, as they had hoped at the beginning, that women could take things into their own hands rather than becoming a weapon in a, a war waged by Stalin against the clergy and the clergy back at him. Thank you, Yasmina. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here.